Hi, uh, welcome to the New Voting Project. Uh, my name is Kanal, your host. And today we're here with Anna Blanco and Joe Shipley. Uh, you guys are both phenomenal students from Princeton University who lead the organization Vote 100. Uh, is a campus campaign aspiring to achieve 100% civic participation amongst collegiate students at Princeton. Um, and so thank you so much for taking the time to come out and, and be part of this interview process. I can understand you are very busy as college students, uh, but I do appreciate it. It's our pleasure. We're really excited to be here. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Of course. Uh, so let's talk, let's, talk, let's talk a little bit about voting. Uh, but before we do that, let's get into your backgrounds. Kind of um, tell us or, you know, talk a little bit about where you're from, how you got into the voting rights space, how colleges at Princeton, I'm sure some viewers would love to know about that. Anna, you can go ahead if you'd like. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm from Miami, um, but originally from Cuba. Uh, I was born there, uh, but my parents and for the most part, most of my family. Um, we immigrated when I was about three years old. Um, and then my parents got naturalized. And then um, I also got naturalized. And I remember like when I was younger, um, they would be studying for the naturalization test. And they had like these CDs that they'd play in the car and it basically asked a whole bunch of questions. Um, simulating the types of questions that would be asked in the test um and I just remember listening and like answering along with them um and so very early on I was like aware of like civic engagement and voting um and my parents took me to go vote um they were voting um and that year the lines were very long in Florida I think we were in line for like three hours so more. very memorable experience and not in a great way um because i was very young so i was complaining the entire time and it's it's very hot in florida so yeah i just remember being like mm, i want water um but it was also a very formative experience and then um like you know growing up especially when i was like in middle school and high school uh i became very aware of like gun violence especially like mass shootings and stuff and that's an issue that's extremely important to me um and that i'd like to see more legislative action on um and for me there was kind of this natural link between voting um and people being informed voters and them making you know the rationally best choice for themselves in terms of who would represent them um and so i think my like sort of desire to be engaged with like activism kind of translated into the voting sphere as well because I was like the most basic thing that we can do as citizens is vote yeah. um, and then beyond then we can engage in other ways um, but I wanted to at least create awareness for voting and make sure that people were voting yeah solid story <laughs> to say the least um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm from New York City. Uh, I come from like a pretty politically engaged family, also a pretty split family politically. So I sort of grew up with a lot of um, ideological debates uh, in my household. And so that really got me invested in, um, you know, all, all the decisions that you can make as a voter. Uh, and then when I got to Princeton, I started doing um, a little bit of work with incarcerated folks and voting and sort of helping um, with the transition back into, you know, full citizenship after the state sort of denies um, the right to vote while people are incarcerated. Uh, I also was, you know, and, and this this is sort of how I got into Vote 100 specifically, but, you know, I found out that Princeton students did not vote at even close to um typical rates like we had 10 and a half percent turnout in 2014 and it's uh, a common trend in mm -hmm. mo in most ivies at that time like you'd expect right there to be high high volumes of voters and the more i looked at the numbers and the more i was told about how terrible it was uh i, I got interested exactly yeah. people have so much yeah. privilege and they're just not doing anything with it so. yeah we always use that stat line in a lot of our like 
promotion to make people understand why we're trying to get campus so engaged. But like, you'd think people hear vote now. Um, yeah. yeah, it was very eye opening. Yeah, and and I guess so. You know why? Why specifically? You know, join. You know, vote one hundred. Kind of talk about the work that I guess it motivates you, inspires you to take that. You know, to take that leap and kind of encourage the rest of your your friends, your peers, your colleagues to, to go out there and vote. Yeah, I mean, I, I can I can start with this one and pass it on to Anna. But um, for, for me, it was really about, you know, kind of being disappointed in, in my community a little bit, thinking that, you know, Princeton has um, Prince, Princeton has a long tradition of sort of being um, focused on civic engagement or, you know, you know, saying that the education is, is designed to get people involved civically and to give back to a society that has given them a lot already. Um, and so it really seemed like a, a good place to start in terms of making sure that this community that already has so much is really giving back by actually going to the polls on election day and making their voices heard um, and actually realizing how great a responsibility it, a responsibility it is to cast a vote um, in this country. And I think the vote 100 has really borne that out. Like I, I do feel like I've made an impact on my community specifically. And now that, you know, now that we have seen so much progress and improvement, the obviously the next step is just to branch out past you know, Princeton, because we have all these wonderful resources and it's time that, you know, they don't just go to people as, you know, privileged as, as we are. Yeah. And, and on that progress, do you have any specific unsolved numbers for me on, on 2020? I know the report was just released. Yeah. Anna, do you want to do the big reveal? Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, so we actually posted a 24.9% increase from 2016 and our voter turnout in 2020 among undergraduate and graduate students uh, was 75.4%. Um, so we're really, really proud of that because I think that's one of the few times that Princeton is actually above the national average when it comes to voting and student voting. I mean, those are great numbers. I mean, it's really like a C, but like C is pretty good. For, for voting for voting um, in, an, in an election uh, and it was it was a it was definitely interesting election uh, and and we're gonna talk about that uh, a little later um, but in fact what would you say is is your is your kind of strategy but you know what what did you do uh, preceding the 2020 election to kind of um, conjure up and, and spark so many people to come out there and vote? Uh, with vote 100 you know, I think I think a lot of it was just having a, a steady presence on campus I mean it, really everywhere you looked or at least our goal was that everywhere you looked on this campus there would be some kind of messaging from vote 100 whether it was telling you where the polling place was telling you what the deadlines were um, you know helping you uh, put postage on your mail-in ballot um, our goal was just kind of to make sure that everybody would get messaging no matter where they were positioned on this campus. Um, I mean, we, we made a concerted effort to reach out to, to the students in STEM fields because they usually have a much lower voting rate. Um, so we worked with professors to make sure that messaging, you know, got into classrooms where it wouldn't otherwise normally be heard. Um, so really it was, it was just about kind of blanketing the campus in messaging. And I know that some people, you know, some people will in inevitably get a little frustrated, but it's, you know, kind of a small price to pay if you're, you know, doing everything you possibly can to make sure folks know when, where, and how the election is going to be conducted. Yeah, and in regards to that, like, Joe basically, like, covered everything, um, but I guess, like, our guiding idea was very much, we want, like, we don't want the, the, I guess, the excuse um, for not voting um, to be a lack of information. Mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure that people knew that the election was happening. I mean, it's kind of hard to know elections aren't happening when it's a national one, especially mm -hmm. a presidential one. Um, but we wanted people to know, at least in one shape or form, like these are the resources that they can use um, to vote, register to vote, 
um, and we tried to make it a little bit easier for them because there are already so many barriers, um, especially like voting during the pandemic, um, knowing which states allowed like mail-in and early voting. Right. Um, so we wanted to facilitate the dissemination of that knowledge and really point people to the resources they can um, they could use uh, to find more information that was specific to their states. Right. And and what's what's the plan going forward? I mean, the organization is dedicated to to getting a hundred percent of people uh, voting in an election. That's a bold goal, um, as far as I can tell. Uh, and what you get seventy five percent. So you have you know one quarter left, one quarter of graduate and undergraduate students. What's what's the plan? You know, what's what's the secret recipe um, that that you guys are hiding in your vault, uh, much like Coca Cola. Actually, uh, among undergrads, the turnout rate was closer to 80 percent. So we've okay. only got uh, only only got a fifth left to go. Okay. Um, and those are those are obviously those are eligible students. So students who are um, eligible to vote in U.S. elections. Um, you know, we're sort of right now we are thinking about how we can how we can get that done. We've we brought in a bunch of new fellows and we're hoping that um, they have some new ideas to shake it up. I mean, we sort of tried just about everything under the sun um, before the 2020 election. We texted every single undergraduate. Um, we had uh, promotions um, that involved you know, free food if people like and were able to find where the ballot box was on campus. Obviously, you can't pay anybody or provide an incentive to vote, but we were we were as creative as we could be with making sure that people um, knew where and how to vote. Um, and so I think going forward, a lot of this will be um, targeting specific groups who have lower turnout. Um, I mean, we we closed the STEM gap um, in 2020, so STEM students are no longer less likely, and in some cases, they're more likely to vote. Um, but there are a couple of you know standout disciplines that don't vote as much, and I don't need to call them out right here and now. <laughs> um, but you know, we, yeah, we can't put them on. one of those disciplines is Joe's major. Um, they awesome. didn't do as good as they traditionally do. Interesting. Um. <laughs> uh, this feels very personal. Um, you know, as a mediator of this conversation, I'm just going to stay neutral. But Joe, mm. got to get your shit in order, man. I'm trying. The history department did. The history department no. definitely it. was not Joe's fault. And it was history, my fault. I believe that. Mm. And history used to have like the highest voter turnout, so I guess they just got cocky. Yeah, I mean, come on, history. History, historians, scholars, even. See, I'm, I'm just, I'm just stretching it. You should know, or at least your genre of academia should understand the, the, the power and and precedence of voting in national elections, um, and and the influence it can have on decades on Supreme Court justices, an issue we're dealing with now. I mean, there are serious implications of, of voting. I'm not calling you out, but I'm calling you out uh, very openly. Uh, so you're welcome. No, uh, fair. Those who, uh, <laughs> those who don't study history are doomed to repeat it. I guess we didn't study history well enough because we know where low voter turnout gets us. Well, at least, at least I know what I'm doing um, after this call, which is um, <laughs> trying to help you get some voters from the history department to vote. Um, that's your goal for 2022 midterms. Uh, but I actually want to roll it back and, and talk about the 2020 election. Uh, obviously, you know, a- extremely significant um, for, for my generation, Gen Z, uh, but for also college students. Right? We saw them historically voting um, at, at very high numbers, much like Princeton University students. Um, and, and I just want to talk about what your thoughts were as, as college students, as just regular citizens of the United States, you know, what were, what were your, what is your analysis of, of the 2020 election? Um, and what, what do you draw uh, from, from the results? Go ahead, Anna. Okay. Um, I think one thing that, you know, it, it'll remain to be seen, um, but there's very much the question of, nationally, not even looking at student populations, but nationally, if the increase in voter turnout was because of, you know, accessibility to the ballot and decreasing voter apathy and just 
the amazing mass mobilization efforts by so many grassroots organizations, um, which which was generally like tremendous work. Um, whether that alone was the reason behind the increased turnout or whether it was, you know, the nature of the election during a pandemic that was, you know, shaking the country and two very different um, candidates and a very contentious political atmosphere mm. uh, that seems very, I guess it, it almost seems like an ultimate battle for like the future of the nat- nation. Mm. And so I think a lot of people definitely felt like this is serious, like I need to vote. So I think it'll be interesting to see whether this is something that remains a trend of people turning out and realizing the importance of voting or whether this might have been a more isolated thing because of the nature of the 2020 election specifically. Um, And, you know, my hope is that turnout continues to increase. And I think for that to happen, like mobilization needs to continue to occur, grassroots organizing, um, but we're also seeing a lot of increasing restrictions to the vote, like including in my home state of Florida, um, mail-in ballot um, now has an additional number of, um, of like, requirements um, before we're able to send it in. I don't remember the specifics of all of them super well, but it is a little bit more difficult to uh, to request a mail-in ballot. And that's going to affect different populations. Um, And so understanding the effects of current legislation and new legislation and A, lobbying against those being passed, um, B, really working with the populations that they're gonna disproportionately affect to make sure that they're able to overcome some of those barriers and actually vote. Um, And I think another thing is like continuing education and awareness about just how important voting is Mm -hmm. beyond just the president. Um, But the implications, for example, like, you know, 2022 is coming up um, and the future of the House and Senate are up for grabs. And that's incredibly important in terms of the laws that we'll be able to to pass. Um, So just making sure people can connect the political to their everyday lives. Of course. And I just want to, you know, as a side note, I was uh, reading a New York Times article um, and it was actually comparing um, in, it was a a counterfactual. So in in 20 years, um, you know, the 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 number and the amount of political polarization uh, would actually extend to to corporate uh, America, where there would be red ba- red brands and blue brands, and you know voters and people would have to make a choice: Am I going with the organization that supports LGBTQ rights, or am I not? Um, and and just the the sheer and dire amount of polarization right now. This is to your comment about it being a trend or an isolated event. I mean, I don't know if that, I, I feel it wasn't a battle. I feel it might be a war. You know what I mean? It, it's going to extend beyond 2020. I'm looking forward to the 2022 midterms. It'll be an indicator, uh, a bellwether of what, what our Senate and, and House is looking like, but also our next presidential election um, and, and the ramifications of that. But, but Joe, no, I, I, I noticed you wanted to say something. These are important topics. <laughs> oh, no, I, I, I agree with everything that Anna said and everything that you said. I mean, Bill 100 is, is nonpartisan, um, but obviously we have, you know, we have a compelling interest in making sure um, political, political rhetoric on campus is, is civil and constructive. Um, we've done our best to do that. Um, our, our goal is just to make sure every, everybody who possibly can vote votes because that's you know that's the only way forward in a democracy um so you know we've we've done our best to kind of weather a very acrimonious um you know atmosphere uh, and I think, we, I think we've done it pretty well for the most part i mean it gets i think it gets trickier and trickier um but we're hoping that voting can be something that kind of unifies people rather than, than dividing them further yeah yeah and beyond just like the simple act of voting, we want people to be informed voters um, and have access to the information 
so that they can make the best decision for themselves and beyond just voting like national state elections like local elections are so important like you mentioned midterms will be a good thermometer for what the political climate might be but even local elections i think it was pennsylvania that had their gubernatorial election um like that's already been considered a thermometer kind of election oh, uh, for what's virginia. to come virginia i don't know why i always confuse those states um but yeah. even then like new jersey had its gubernatorial election extremely close yeah um and these are elections that matter they decide very important like aspects of like day-to-day life yeah and and it's interesting interesting to see right 2020 election almost 160 million voters um total uh and and it was pretty much an even split you know difference of five million uh for one side uh for joe biden and what i find hard to believe is you know any scholar any side conservative leftist uh democrat anybody would say that's great right because scholars would argue the more people that turn out the higher chance you have of your candidate winning so i find it uh disappointing that one certain majority uh, is kind of following this wave across the U.S. um, and trying to suppress voters. You had mentioned that happening in Florida. I see that happening in Texas. I see that happening in Georgia. I I forget, is that over 400 anti-voting suppression bills across the all United States legislators um, and it's at the state level um, just after the 2020 election, post-2020. So, so obviously, uh, that's something to worry about. I, I imagine Joe, as a history major, is taking notes um, <laughs> because historically that's bad. Um, and I always mention, you know, uh, kind of civil war post that every all the traumatic voting issues we've had to deal with, um, and and it's it's honestly just just a repeat. Um, so 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 yeah, I don't know any thoughts on that. Well, I guess I was right. I don't, I, I mean, this is, yeah, uh, that was perfect. Um, now I kind of want to discuss expanding. What, what, what are your thoughts on expanding voting accessibility to younger, uh, younger people? Right now the voting age is at 18. Um, sh- do you think 16 year olds should be allowed to vote? Um, it's been proposed in some municipalities at, at, the, at the localist levels. So school board elections, some city council elections, uh, but but do you see that as an adequate response to expanding voting rights? I you know I I and I'm just speaking personally here. I think but it's fair to say Vote 100 as, as an organization does not have a particular stake in um, lowering l- lowering or raising the voting age. Um, but I I think it's great. I think that, you know the as, as much as we're able to expand the franchise, you know reasonably i think we we should um i i do think it's fair to expect that um you know to to start with municipal and local elections maybe state elections so um you know people can get started in elections that really matter and are kind of uh underserved by voters and also that are you know in a, in a different sense lower stakes than national elections um so i think it'd be a good way to ease into you know, the being a voter. Um, I think, you know, some of the 16 year olds I know are not necessarily mature enough to cast a ballot, but then again, some of the 50 year olds I know are not mature enough to cast a ballot. So who am I to judge? That's fair. Yeah, I definitely agree with Joe. Um, I think there are some people that I've met that are tremendously involved and they're not even like eligible to vote. Um, because of the voting age requirement. Um, And I think beyond that too, there's um, the consideration of citizenship status. Um, I think California, not super sure about this, but I think California actually like some cities um, slash counties allows um, some of its like, you know, non-legal residents um, to have a stake um, in what's going on in decisions, because ultimately they are affected by them. They live there um, and they will be affected by the policies. Um, so I think that's a super important consideration, like how the definition of citizenship might limit the voices of some people who do not have that access um, 
right now. Um, so I think definitely starting at the local level is important. Yeah, I I a hundred percent agree. Um, the local elections, I feel you can you have the power to actually impact your community. Uh, I'm gonna look into that um, and see which cities and counties in the state of California actually allow um, non-resident aliens to vote. That that would be a pretty interesting implementation um, as a solution. Uh, but I kind of want to close out and 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 ask for advice. Uh, you know, as the next generation, how can can we make an impact, Gen Z, on voting, on elections, on policy, uh, wanting to stay engaged? How do we reach out to to those that feel alienated um, and exhausted, or maybe those that are just ignorant, um, much like you know the people in Joe's major at Princeton uh, for some reason? Uh, but but what what can we do, and what 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 do you recommend that we do? I mean, I think the, the first and most basic piece of advice is vote, vote every, every chance you get. Um, it sounds really simplistic, but you, I mean, you would not believe the number of people that I've been talking to who were like, oh yeah, of course I'm going to vote like six months before the election. Then it's two days before election day and they haven't registered, they haven't sent in their ballot, whatever. Like it's, it's not the easiest task in the world. It's not something that should be put off. Um, it's not something you should take for granted. And so that is, I think, the, the best advice that our generation can possibly get because politicians and policymakers are not going to listen to us until we're a meaningful, reliable voting block. I mean, the, the only reason that you know groups like the AARP have so much power and because they you know they represent an, an age group is because that age group is known for its constant voter turnout and we could be that way too um if only we'd just be a, a reliable um force in the American electorate yeah and shout out to your major too I think I think you're just talking about your major at this point I mean you need to be a reliable uh, uh, uh recurring voter Look, I, I would not mind if history majors were a significant chunk of the uh, of the electorate. I think you know, I think we've got it going up here. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I also think that um, the you know the other thing that I would say is just not to you know not to lose heart. I mean, when we were Anna, I, I can't speak for you, although I, I have a feeling we'll feel the same way about this. Um, it, it kind of felt like I was banging my head against a brick wall for a lot of the lead up to the election. I didn't know if the things I was doing would make any difference. I didn't know if, if it was reaching anybody. Um, but when I saw that, you know, we we jumped 24.9 points and that over three quarters of students had voted, you know, more than seven times what we'd had in 2014. And like, I was like, oh, I, I actually you know, like I was a part of something. We vote 100 did something meaningful. Um, so I would say don't, you know, don't lose heart as difficult as that is. Yeah. I definitely agree with Joe. And I think in light of like the restrictions, um, the new restrictions that are being passed, it can be very disheartening and that we like take one step forward and like 10 steps back. But I think it's important to remember the essence of why we vote and that's to have a stake in our democracy and to have a stake in the decisions that are being made on behalf of us. Um, and so I think as long as we keep that messaging up and people understand like, you know, this is so important. Um, and I think we really need to like run with that um, and make sure that people are voting. Yeah, that's the best advice you can give, vote. Um, that's not too hard, is it? Uh, well, no. Uh, thank, thank you so much for, 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 that, for those recommendations. I just want to ask, how can viewers stay updated on what Vote 100 does? Um, this is the only part of the show where you get to self-promote yourself. Uh, so if you want to link, if you want to just shout out your, your at or, or your Twitter, I will link it all in the description. Oh, sure. I mean, our, our Instagram is at Princeton Vote 100. Our website is uh, vote100.princeton.edu pretty easy to remember. Um, Anna, do you have anything you want to plug? Um, no, I would say those are big ones. Um, you can also check out Otis. Um, I forget what the Otis Instagram handle is. That's that's um, the office of the Dean of Undergraduate Students. Yes. Okay. Um, and I think their handle is at Princeton underscore O-D-U-S. I'm All not right. super sure. I can get back All to right. you with that information. 
Yeah, and the next thing you guys should do is also create a Twitter uh, because that's great. <laughs> um, uh, and is there anything you'd like to add? No, we said it all. I mean, we're just that good. Uh, just vote. Exactly, just vote. Uh, super, super simple. Uh, and if you ever need assistance voting and you're a resident or a student in Princeton, in New Jersey, um, please reach out to Joe and Anna. I'm sure they can Absolutely. Um, and I'm sure they'd be more than happy to help you, in fact. Uh, so, so no, thank you so much for, for your time and for, for, for giving great answers and for the work, for the tremendous amount of work and improvement you've done uh, at Vote 100. Um, I'm, I'm happy to see um, that going into college, hopefully Princeton University, uh, you know, such great students can, can set the stage for me and, and for future generations to come. So thank you for that. Thank you. This has been great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I wish you the best uh, of luck in your future endeavors. Take care.